Welcome everybody to the weekly Firefly community call. Thank you for joining. Uh, I, I don't have many announcements for, uh, actually, I don't have any announcements for, for the beginning of the call today, but uh, to, for today's topic, for the first part of the meeting, uh, Peter Broadhurst will be speaking on event-driven programming design, or event-driven application design, uh, and how this is, uh, you know, Firefly is built with this design in mind and uh, things just work great when applications are also built in this with this event driven mindset uh, and Peter's going to talk through uh, kind of how to approach building a firefly app in an event driven way and, uh, and how firefly itself handles things in an event driven way so thank you Peter and I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Nico. And uh, as as per normal, I um, plan to use just, um, I guess, up until 35 past um, on, on this piece and then um, just have another open forum for any any topics that we want to run Firefly after. Yep. OK, so um, we, we thought it would be really good to do a session um, on event-driven programming because there's this sort of assumption in in every every piece of how far uh, firefly has evolved that um the the way that the system the way that the multi-party system will be built is in an event driven way and it's a particular type of programming it's definitely not a new type of programming um but it is a particular pattern and it's not a pattern that everybody's come across um, so I, I want to talk through that pattern from ground, the ground up, really, in this session, and build up to um, talking about how event-driven pro driven programming is different in a multi-party system compared to all the other types of event-driven programming that you've done in the past, and then talk about um, how it actually works practically in Firefly. So that's the... That's the, the, the journey we're going to go through here. Um, so to start with, I want to just really try and be clear about what I mean with um, event-driven programming and why it's what it's different to. Um, and the, the terms I'm going to try and use consistently throughout are request, reply, and events for the two sort of ways, fundamental ways, that if you've got two runtimes administered separately, that they might be like microservice architectures in their own way, but you've got sort of, you know, the, the, the payment system and the reconciliation system where they're separate systems. Um, there's two, there's two really fundamental ways that you can connect them together. And we're not talking about wire protocols or transports here we're just talking about fundamentals you can either use a request reply approach which is synchronous but i'm going to try and not use synchronous and asynchronous because there's so many ways that those could be used um a request reply approach which is like a telephone system one wants to talk to system two so it makes a call to system two and waits waits for that call to complete this is the way you know, a, a REST API to the internet works. Um, it's the fundamental way that HTTP works, although you can layer stuff on top of HTTP. So I, um, it's just like a telephone conversation. You get put on hold until they're ready. If they're behind, they're going to be slow in, in responding to your, your request. And um, uh, you only know that they've done the thing that you're, that you're going, that you've asked them to do if you sit there and you wait for them to do all of that thing and come back with an answer. So the outcomes are either a success, you know, a HTTP 200, okay, um, a failure, um, I've got a 500 or an error or some kind of explicit error. And most of the time with errors, you kind of know what's happened or equally likely just nothing at all. It just sort of a deadline. You know, we've all been on hold to the, you know, to, to the, to the wireless telephone provider and you get put on hold and it's silent and it's like, are they still there? Have I been lost? What's happened? And, and you just sort of eventually give up and put the phone down 
how do you find out if it's worked or it hasn't? Well, you kind of got to retry, you've got to make another phone phone call. Right, so that's that's request reply um, um, approach to building applications. And and there's two there's there's two things. I talked about one of them is that the, both sides have to be available and, and ready to, to talk to each other. The other is it, it's really just a one-to-one -one thing. You know, you you've got um you've got um, one one system on one side and one system on the other and one's talking to the other. So there's a different way of programming and it's a fundamentally different way of programming and this is to use events. Um, to not say that I've got a request and then exactly one reply, to say I'm emitting an event, might be a request, might be a broadcast, might be anything, um, I'm emitting an event and just like with a text message or an email, I can I can choose, I can expect that I'm going to get a response pretty quickly, but I'm not like beholden to having a response really quickly. I, I can go on, get on with my life. I can, as an application, I can move on and do other things. And whenever the other party's ready and it's got through the, I don't know, thousand things I've put uh, people have put in front of it before it gets to that that particular email in their inbox, that particular text message that's come to them that whenever they're ready and they respond you process that response and this is a, a very flexible pattern because um you can have lots of different failure handling strategies you know you can send things multiple times and and we process them which is kind of the only way that you can do it for request reply um messaging but you can also have things like compensation logic we'll talk a little bit about sagas later um, and uh, you can also just choose to ignore things that you can't you can't process and maybe say no nope, I can't process it um, or um, or just just ignore it because you know it's a duplicate or you know you know that there's um, a reason why it's safe to ignore it so it's a very flexible way of programming and as I said before um, Firefly and and th these are some of Nico's um, charts and Nico did a great um, great introduction to Firefly in um, a community session we had um, two three weeks ago, um, so, which is recorded so you can go and listen through the fundamentals here. But but um, Firefly supports both patterns fully, um, and one is built on top of the other, and this is quite common in enterprise systems. The request reply capability is just a special type of events, um, use of events. You're just sending one event and you're expecting exactly one reply. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more later about the actual interfaces here and how you build applications on top of Firefly for, for this. So we'll come, we'll come back to this, I promise. But I'm gonna I'm gonna take a bit of a bit of a um, roundabout route here and, and talk a little bit about the history of um, events. Um, because um, it's a topic dear to my heart. I, I, I've lived it since the very, very, very first day um, of my my career in in, in enterprise IT. I, I worked on on the core of um, one of the messaging technologies in, in IBM called Thank You Series. And um, the year I started, this this book was was published, and it's a pretty famous book in the enterprise um, space. And um, uh, the the Hop and Wolf um, enterprise integration patterns and and the 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 website's still there. So you can go read about them. They're still super applicable patterns. Um, and uh, back back then, you know, um, to 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 turn a bit, uh, uh, you know, this has evolved over about three decades. So this is kind of like the end of the first decade of of um, of the evolution here. We 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 had these patterns that were for integrating systems within an, ent an enterprise right you've got 20 different systems you they're, they're all decoupled across the world um, how do i integrate them together and there's a set of these really well established patterns that evolved into things like an enterprise service bus after this book came out and they evolved into things like service oriented architectures um, and then whole companies formed um uh you know driving home this sort of concept of an event driven architecture um you know famously companies like like tipco really really focused on that for you know, the whole of their existence um uh, uh, you know uh, and that that approach allowed very resilient resilient 
um, systems in, in, in the core of organizations, you know, the payment rails of, of banks, the, you know, the, the, the core transaction processing systems of insurance companies and supply chains and, and healthcare, right? Th those were all built using these integration patterns and they generally were event driven. And all of this happened and then web services happened and rest happened and HTTP became the flavor and a lot of a lot of things moved to a sort of synchronous, um, sorry, request reply based, based approach after this. And then there was another wave. There was another wave in the sort of mid, um, mid 2010s um, of uh, a resurgence of the understanding of why event driven programming at its core is just this fantastic way of, of um, being being really sure you're going to get the right outcome out of the end of something. And, and this time the focus wasn't on multiple systems all connecting together and services all to our architectures. It was about writing really good software. And these fantastic programming languages came out um, and frameworks like Erlang and Scala and then the ACA framework and the reactive manifesto. Um, and um, I, I think that the, the, the pattern that really encompasses it and the best written about sort of description of like, why does event driven programming like create good applications? I think is if you read about the actor model. So I'd encourage you, this is a really great, great like five minute read to, to really understand how event driven programming, even inside of an application, like inside of one, process can allow resilient engineering so don't think of this picture here as multiple multiple players in a network think of this as just i've got bits of logic i can instead of connecting them together by having them all call each other and wait for each other i can put these mailboxes in between them and i can decouple them and i can say one piece of logic updates its internal state and then drives another piece of logic and, and I know everything that's happened. It's a sequence of events. And if you can just think about the way you're writing the end-to-end -end business logic, not, not like how the system fits together, the business logic, if you can start to think about it as the set of state changes in a, in a state machine, and, and you can break all of those state changes back into being a set of inputs, a function that runs on them, deterministic or non-deterministic, that's fine, doesn't matter, function that runs on them, and then it triggers one or more other items of processing. That way of working happens to allow you to scale really nicely to a distributed system. Now, um, microservices then came, came along. Um, one of the most exciting things to happen to the way that we build applications over um certainly the whole of my my, my career and, and we start building these monoliths we start building these massive java um application server applications that just like were all in a in a box and we started we started writing things that the application itself needed to be decoupled and connected together and like some of it's written in java and some of it's written in node.js and some of it's written in Go, and maybe some of it's written in Erlang and Scala, but all of these bits are running independently and scaled independently. And um, a whole new generation of programmers um, uh, came uh, and performed some amazing innovation. Um, Chris Richardson that, that wrote some of the stuff on this slide is, uh, is a great innovator in the space. And, and um, it, we discovered a lot of the same challenges that the previous wave of integration system challenges and the enterprise integration patterns had discovered before and um and and had to even inside of one application now inside of one application because it's split into lots of different one times had to worry about how do you do a sequence of events with a reliable outcome um and if you if you follow this this link you'll you'll hear about the saga pattern which is kind of multiple services had events from the beginning they thought about events from the beginning um saga is kind of like the latest generation of how people think about i've got a bit of logic it needs to call another bit of logic what how do i cope when that follow-on piece of logic doesn't doesn't complete what what does compensation look like in the modern in the modern world what, what if i've got a history of events and this is the critical thing if i've got a history of events 
and something fails, I can look back at what happened and decide what to do. But I can only do that, and that's why it's called a saga, if I've got this history, like it's a, an evolving story that's got a, you know, a story arc that goes from, from Frodo and Hobbiton all the way through to Frodo coming, coming, coming back, um, having to eat smog, like right? that, all of the, 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 all of those hundreds of pages of, uh, of story arc, right? That's what your transaction looks like. And if you've not got all of the pages in the book marked out, in a way that you can look back at them, it's really hard to know what to do when something goes wrong. So if you think about it as this sort of evolving saga with information about everything that happens, you can kind of cope with anything, which is which is beautiful. It's it's it, it sort of feels like utopia from a programming perspective, but it does have some challenges, which should, um, and you do have to think in a slightly different way. So I'd encourage you to read some of the things that I've linked to here, because but you know. But, People who, who are much more literate than me have, um, have really talked through in a, in a great way, like why event-driven programming in all of its forms is valuable. So here we are in, in the 2020s and we're on the edge of a new wave, right? This multi-party system thing that's evolving, that, that, that Firefly's trying to accelerate, it, and that is, you know, the thing that is enabled by enterprise blockchain and by these fantastic technologies like zero knowledge proofs and, and, and peer file sharing technologies like IPFS and, and trusted compute engines, right? This multi-party systems revolution, this next step in the journey um, is really exciting because some things haven't changed, but really important things have. So let me talk about that. Right. So what hasn't changed? The majority, the vast majority, because it's already been written, it's in place, it's it's the existing core systems of processing is still going to be unique to each player in the system. Right. The, 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 we're connecting people together and previously we might have been using REST interfaces that aren't so event driven. We might have been using event driven integration patterns between people. Um, in the between organizations in the past. Um, and, and there obviously everything was private because there was no shared state. But even in a multi-party system, you have to just bear in mind that most of what the business cares about in terms of their processing, their human decision making, their business processes, even special, you know, proprietary logic that they've got that they think is valuable is going to be unique to each member. And that's going to be the majority. In terms of lines of code, it's always going to be the majority. Um, it, it may not be the most critical piece of uh, pieces, and, th and that's why the blockchain can be so valuable. But it, it, you know, there's just so much logic that is going to be unique. And, and it's the same with the data. The vast majority of the data in an enterprise situation, and here it's like it's the 99% case. The data, by volume at least, the, 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 the data is going to be to really private and sensitive if it wasn't private and sensitive there wouldn't be an interesting problem to solve right so those things have not changed but some stuff has changed and the stuff that's changed to me it's the reason why i got into blockchain it's the reason why um i went on the, 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 the journey and we found a collider right is is suddenly you can do this stuff in a fundamentally different way because a few things have changed so some logic some logic can be executed deterministically. We can execute it in a way that no one can argue on the outcome because every you know enough people executed it or they executed it with a proof. You know, there's there's a consensus or, or a trusted compute um, proof or zero knowledge proof that says, look, there's no arguing about the fact that this particular bit of processing happened. That's fantastic. It enables tokens. It enables. Um, it enables like critical sort of decision making processes that are at the heart of the most sophisticated um, transactions. Right? It, it allows those to be executed to permanently across the organizations. And that's fantastic. And that's never been possible before. And, and it also allows you to store some data in a way that everybody has it. And, that, and that's really cool. I mean, it's kind of been possible be before, um, but, uh, but, you know, the, the, it's really embraced in uh, in if you use technologies like blockchain or IPFS, you can have references or the data itself stored in a, in a in a place 
that everybody has got a copy of that data and that, that's fantastic but again bear in mind that's not going to be all of your data because th th there's challenges with that random bias um, case and then the thing that this all builds upon particularly all of this this determinant execution logic is is the thing for this presentation in particular that's transformative revolutionary over every previous generation of this tech instead of just having an event bus that's local to one organization we've now got a shared sequence of events the sequence the order is agreed through a really resilient multi-party consensus driven technology a blockchain a distributed ledger how cool is that that is just mind-bogglingly um, uh, transformative to how event-driven systems can work because suddenly now that sequence of events can be multi-party systems of events that wasn't true in the event-driven integration age that wasn't true in the rest web services um, uh, soap um, uh, age for an soa for connecting together organizations um, microservices proved how powerful it was to have that inside of an application but microservices are you know that's about building one application inside of an individual organization now we can do this in a way that just can't be argued right it's it's not worth arguing that pff, blockchain's wrong right that you, you're not going to have this where's my what sequence of things happen in where's my message kind of challenge that we've always had in the in the past so it's, it's transformative and what that means from a, a solution development perspective is that you can now you can now build these multi-party business processes and get some maybe most but some still massive um of the benefits that you that you could just the things you could rely on when you were just building a system inside of your organization like you're building you know maybe previous generation business process management you're modeling a business process maybe you're building microservices you're building a solution that 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 you know has a user interface has apis connects to your core systems that implements a business process gets a transaction done end to end right we could do that inside of an organization we can now do the same thing cross organization and that's really where Firefly is trying to make the job simpler. You connect together the super on-chain logic, the tokens, the you know, simple pinning as well, but the custom on-chain logic, you connect that together with the off-chain integration to the core systems across multiple parties. And we've got the shared sequence of events so we can actually like do the same kind of application and business process that you could do with a microservices architecture in one organization. But there is a couple of gotchas, a couple of things that just like the laws of physics are a little bit different in this environment to they were in um, in just like microservices isolated environment to, to one organization. And one difference to having seen lots of developers building this pattern is because, you know, we've been doing this for quite a while in the evolution of, 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 of Firefly and before it came into Hyperledger. Um, one of the things that's a little bit like of a sort of ah, squint how did that happen um is th the event bus when it's a blockchain backed event bus when it's an event that's significant enough to sequence it across organizations you can't just assume when you send the event that you know where it slots into the sequence on the sending side now that has not ever been true really in 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 messaging systems right i've got i've got a kafka queue or or an mq or tipco sb or an active mq between me you know my my system like the, i don't know what would you say payments and reconciliation where i've got my payment system it's all the reconciliation system i send message one two three i i just sort of know that one two three is going to arrive on the other side and they're going to process message one two three right that's just true well it's a little bit different here because the um, you're not the only one submitting the 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 apps. You can't just create, like even if you do you're doing horizontal scale in microservices, you can still often like know that you're the only one that's sending these events. 
the events are being sent from the other sides as well. There's like five parties involved. They're all sending these events. You can't assume just because you sent that event that it's going to arrive first. So here's the trick. You, as the sender, also need to process that event in the order of the blockchain that everybody else is saying. So you end up with this sort of initiate confirm step on your own, your own logic. You have to sort of say, look, I think the first, well, the first one isn't so interesting. I think the second step, like, is um, is uh, I don't know, it's a bidding system. It's like, right, I wanna, I wanna, uh, I, I've received a, a request for for a tender. I'm gonna, I'm gonna submit. Um, but the, like the first five submissions win. I think that I've, I'm going to submit and um, my submission's going to be um, number four. And I submit it because I looked and there was only three submissions before I submitted it. Well, that's not good enough to know that you were number four. You can't trigger the bit of your logic that says to your users, I've submitted it and you're number four at that point. You can't show that state yet to your users. You can't have that in your core systems because until it's been ordered and then you process it and at the point that you're processing it you look at the current state and you say i'm still number four number you know another number four didn't come in before me you can't rely on it being true so just because you sent it doesn't make you special you have to process you have to think of your own events being ordered along with everybody else's so that's really like it sounds subtle, but that really does just create an extra level of um, thought in your applications. You have to do a send and then you have to process your own applications. Now, one thing that we are doing in Firefly, and there's an issue tracking this, 112, um, is we are going to make it so that if you want to, Firefly will block and try not to use synchronous and asynchronous because but it, um because this is this is hard, right? This is this is not changing the fact that this is an asynchronous event that I'm sending, we can make it so that it will block until you've got the confirmation from the blockchain. And that event's been confirmed. So you don't have to, you know, if you want to just sort of wait and have a spinner, if you want that, um, then you can do that. And that, that there's a, just a few places where it's like particularly early on in development, it's super, super easy to do that. So we're going to add, add that, add that into Firefly. So there's now another difference, um, and I'm conscious on time, and I've been waffling a bit. Um, but but there's another there's another difference here, um, and and I think this one's really significant um, personally. Um, blockchains, if you squint, are a messaging technology. If you squint, um, but there are very, very different shaped messaging technology to traditional message queuing and streams. So if you've used, if you've used one, well, you know, one of those MQ technologies, or you've used, you know, the latest generation of things like Kafka streaming, um, you know that they're super reliable, right? They, 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 they look after your messages, they get them to you really from A to B really, really quickly. They batch, they optimize, they have durability or persistence, it's often called. They, you know, they cope with periods of downtime, they'll buffer things, they'll like they're they're awesome. And those technologies should still be used in these sort of modern systems. Um, but but they're not like a complete history of time. It, it, I believe without exception, and, and I'm happy to be proof wrong on it, that, um, but I believe without exception, they, they say it's a really big anti-pattern, even if they support like turning up the size of your queue depth, you know, or transaction ledger to infinity. They're not designed to be a replayable complete history of time. They're designed to be a buffer from A and B, to be a mailbox. Your mail goes into it, you know, the postman can fill it up to the top, they can stick stuff on top of it maybe a bit, they can stick stuff on, underneath, but eventually it becomes full. Um, and when you want to read stuff, you take it out of the mailbox and you open it. And it's no longer in the mailbox anymore. 
That's different to the way a blockchain ledger works. Blockchain ledger is designed to allow you to look back in history and see the complete history of time. And that's super fantastic. That's, that means that things like late join and, and catching up and looking at the state of the state of things, you know, if you're new or you're catching up or you're going back in time, you can see like a saga, you can see the, the complete history now and you can build applications that can have that that history in a, an immutable way that that's if you've, if you've read about the utxo model um uh the the, the unspent uh, transaction output a uh, model um of the way that blockchains like bitcoin work that that's what they're built on right that that concept that you know for sure right now you can trust the right now but also you know you can prove the right now by looking back in time to the beginning of beginning of time so so anyway, that's that I think is a really significant thing. And just to reiterate, Firefly is built on this concept that you kind of need both. You need the private, reliable messaging, and you need the um, you, you need the, the the ledger. Uh, 